Welcome to another video. My name is Harvey Newman and I like to share my passion for animation here in this channel with all of you. Today we are going to be doing something that we haven't done in a while and that is an interview. An interview with one of my favorite people on YouTube right now and that is Jean Denis and a fellow animator. He has been working in ILM in VFX for over 15 years now. He has so much knowledge to give and he has one of the best YouTube channels for animators that I know of. On top of that, he's one of the most hardworking people I know of. He is spinning about six different plates. He is a father, first and foremost, works in ILM during the daytime. He's a mentor, an animation mentor, he has a professional course that he teaches and also does YouTube. And he does it all with a lot of grace, a lot of positivity and a lot of humility. And I think he's an amazing example for all upcoming animators, and especially if you want to get into the VFX industry. I asked JD to have a sit down with me, talk about his life, his career, how he got here. And I think the interview is going to be very fascinating to all of you. He has a lot to give and you guys have a lot to learn from this. I'm really glad that JD took the time. So without further ado, let's start this interview. So here we are uh, with a JD, Jean Denis, YouTube celebrity, working on a mission mentor, working in this course, supervising animator and ILM. Basically, this man has done it all and <laughs> has decided to take some time to actually speak with me and actually kind of uh, give me a little bit of information about how he got to this point and uh, the, some of the work that he does on behind the scenes. And also uh, he's going to like share with us a little bit about how he actually kind of got to ILM, got to be a supervisor and his passion for animation that is clearly visible on all his YouTube. <laughs> big fan. So welcome JD. How's it going? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I appreciate the time. And just to clarify, because if any, anybody from Ireland watches this, I'm associate um, animation supervisor, uh -huh. and I've done one show. I've done supervising on like a commercial, and when supervisors are on vacation during a show, they say you take over. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm not like you know if anybody goes, wait, wait, he's not a full supervisor. <laughs> I'm associate for a short time, just in case anybody is picky. Yeah. About titles. But internally, I'm still listed as a senior uh, animator. That's what they have. Okay, okay, makes sense. So, for the record, your full name, Jean Denis. Haas is the last name, Jean Denis Haas, but I go by JD. JD, uh, you were just telling me off camera that uh, I assumed that you were French, but you are not. My mom is French, so I'm, you know, however people take this, I'm half French, half Swiss. My dad is Swiss from the French part, but we grew up in Lucerne, which is the, the German part. That is fascinating. So you grew up with a bit of a German culture, French culture, Swiss culture, all together. Yes, but we traveled a lot in general. Um, so even as a kid, I think it was in San Francisco when I was like seven or something. So it's always wow. kind of, we're always kind of out there. I'm not really bound to Switzerland. We're always kind of traveling around. And I think that's why it was, I wouldn't say easy, but okay for me to leave Switzerland. Yeah. But yes, but we speak uh, French at home. Because we as animators have to move about quite a bit. Do you think that actually has made it easier for you and your family to kind of move about and just be comfortable with it? Well, thankfully to me, we were moving, moving. We were just traveling in terms of vacation, seeing mm -hmm. multiple things. Um, so I grew up in the German part and I've been there forever. We kind of moved places within there, you know, but that's like a half hour move. I know people in Switzerland that they, they obviously they're born there. They grew up there. And for them, it's 
that's my country. I'm going to live there forever and I love it. And I understand it's, it's, a, it's a great country, but I don't have that. Like I was okay moving here. At the same time, now I've been here since fall 99, so almost 20 years in the States. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, I'm almost here longer than in Switzerland. I'm, I'm 42. Now, if I had to move somewhere, because like you said, we never know. I would totally do it, but I'm less, let's go, <laughs> like when I was from Switzerland to San Francisco. There's something about when once you have family and you don't want to disturb that. But I know it's a reality of this, of this business. People always talk about the plan B and... Just being ready. I've been at ILM for 15 years. When I started there, there was someone that was there for eight, nine years. And he said, oh, when I hit my 10 years, I got to go. Mm -hmm. I got to do something new. So ever since then, people either were laid off, sadly, or left on their own. So there's always someone leaving. And then you think, hmm, maybe I should kind of check. Uh, I have a demo reel ready. I don't have a demo reel ready. I have nothing ready. You always think about it, but yeah. I never really act on it. But I think, you know, as things change, I should probably prepare. And now with the, the streaming business and, you know, everything's kind of changing right now uh -huh. business-wise. So that's why I feel like maybe now we should just be a bit more careful. ILM was the company that created all the amazing special effects for Star Wars to begin with, right? Yeah, and cre created so, all the other companies. People leaving ILM and then created other companies. Other companies as well. Which became... is good. We need, we need competition. But I feel yeah. like game companies, if you feel like that, is even when other companies close, I think there are more game companies opening up. There's more of a closing, opening, closing, opening. Closing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bizarre thing when you are inside for enough years, then you start to fear exactly what you meant, right? It feels like no company is 100% solid that you can just spend all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because it's such a young industry, it feels like there's always new companies opening up and being the next bit, big thing. So it's always exciting. It's just that I think we're getting old. I'm 39 <laughs> now. <laughs> so as you said, you have family, you kind of just go the opposite way. I want to be in a place with my family and be happy and just be comfortable. How would JD describe himself? In general, as a human Just being? Or? As a human being. <laughs> as a human being, let's That's a see. big question. That's a big question, yes. <laughs> I would say passionate about work, like you said, um, where sometimes I'm, I'm like overboard obsessed mm -hmm. with learning and taking things in and watching stuff. And at the same time, I'm incredibly lazy. Mm -hmm. I think if I had to describe myself, I have those two things where I get sometimes obsessed with a topic and I do something. And then sometimes I just, I just need to be home and do nothing. I literally do nothing. I sit on the couch and kind of daydream yeah. or listen to music or just watch stuff or, you know, Twitter is kind of distracted watching things. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think even though we traveled and we did things, I'm very home driven. If I would go home and say, hey, there's a party outside, let's go. I would be the one going, nah, I want to stay home and <laughs> eat a pizza, watch a movie. I'm more that type of person. Yeah, it's a big question to unpack. Uh, but, you, should, you should ask my wife. <laughs> you have a better answer. That's interesting because uh, you kind of just described, described how I feel as well. It's uh -huh. like to me, it feels that you spend so much time researching and curious about life that mm -hmm. I think your brain at some point just feels like, just give me a break, man. And, and it's at those points that you just feel like, I just want to stay at home. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also you're at work mm. Monday to Friday, sometimes Saturday. Yeah. And then when you get home, like you miss home. Like I miss, I miss my place. Like I want to just be home. Mm. But I understand that for, when someone is home all the time, they want to go out. Oh, you're finally home. Let's go out. Yeah. You know, like friends like, oh, you finally, it's the weekend. We can see you. Let's go out. Mm. So I understand there's always that kind of push and pull. Um, cool. So, you know, this kind of balance. I try to, you can't always be locked up in your office. So I try to go out and, and do things. Yeah. But uh, if my wife uh, would be watching this, she would say, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, going back to the beginning, mm -hmm. right from the beginning, um, how were you the kind of person that was interested in animation since a very young age? Or did you just like discover that love over the years? Yeah, I was born in 77. So for me, when I was six or seven or so, I saw Star Wars. It's like mm -hmm. the cliche thing. I saw Star Wars and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, like my dad is a big movie fan. We always watch movies and documentaries and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. for me, being a kid more from the 80s, I guess that's my childhood. It's, you know, Star Wars and Ghostbusters and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's kind of back to the future. So it's always kind of more special effects. Mm -hmm. and Disney as well. But I don't think I made that connection of this is animation. Like I didn't know anything about the Nine Old Men or anything like that. Yeah. So it was mostly special effects. Actually, when I left uh, to come to the States and I went to the Academy here, I took special effects. That was my, my track. 
And I took one class for maybe 20 minutes and it was all about uh, scripting and math mm -hmm. and how to do the special effects. I thought this is going to be hands-on. You do like tornadoes and lightning and stuff like that. And I quit and then switched to animation. I went to my advisor and she said, well, try animation. It was more my thing. That being said, the second cliche thing is Toy Story because I can't draw. Mm -hmm. I love to draw. Like, I love the feeling of holding a pencil and everything, yeah. but I can't draw. From, yeah. It's ridiculous. So when I saw Toy Story, I thought, oh, you can do something like this without having to draw. Coming here was you know, either ILM or Pixar. That was kind of the cliche thing of, I want to work at those places. Yeah. Um, but I'm massively influenced by, by ILM and special effects. That's so cool. So Star Wars and Toy Story. Yeah, Star Wars in terms yeah. of, wow, this is a crazy world. And then seeing all those special effects movies. Mm. And then Toy Story, because it was just something new. It was computer generated. That was interesting. But I did, um, we used to do like copying text or like for handwriting. So you practice handwriting. Oh. And then if it say the word would be lightning, I would draw lightning rods or tree. I would draw. So I would hand in my homework in primary school and you're a kid. And it was just text plus drawings everywhere. So That's I think cool. that was the earliest and she let me do that. I can't remember my teacher's name, but she let me do that. Thank you. Yeah. She never watch this. <laughs> uh, so for me, it was that mm. and the movies. Yeah. But I guess it stayed somehow in your subconscious as well as when you actually picked up animation, right? Because you kind of just yeah. felt like, okay, so this is the same thing as flip books. Yes. And I was, I was happy that I, I liked it because it's like, you know, you leave your country, you go to a school and you try something new. Yeah. I didn't know it's going to work out if you're going to like it. And then when I took those classes, like, oh, this is really cool. I really like this. Uh, even like pencil tests, like seeing, seeing your drawings come to life, even in a crappy way, that was really cool. And th that connected. And I, I, was, I was lucky that it worked for me and I liked it. And that it was something that could continue. When you first moved from Europe, to mm -hmm. the US, mm -hmm. um, I guess it was to study, right? Yes. Um, how, how was that? And you anticipated actually staying in the US and uh, was it difficult, the whole thing? So for me, it was always, I'm gonna go there, I love it. I mean, I'm assuming I'm gonna love it. And then maybe I come back, mm -hmm. that's kind of the thing. It wasn't, I thought it's gonna be hard, but I was really lucky because I went to the, uh, the dorms of the academy. Mm -hmm. So I, I came here and, um, I knew San Francisco a little bit because when I was a kid, I knew like Alcatraz, like that was my exposure to that, like hot dogs, like eating, you know, crappy foods, which mm -hmm. I love. So coming here, I thought it's going to be kind of scary. I show up at the dorm and the, the manager of the dorm spoke French. So that already was, oh, okay, I can speak with someone, my, you know, I've broken English. It's going to be okay. Then my roommate, he was American, but then my, um, my neighbor was from Dubai, but he spoke French. And then the neighbor on the other side was from Austria. So he spoke German. Mm -hmm. So then when I brought, I digitized some tape. Just something you, can, you can take a VHS tape, I'm that old. Uh, and then transfer it to NTSC tape for America. So I brought some of my childhood movies in German, which then my Austrian friend knew. And then we started watching that together. So I felt like there was a lot of, in a way, support and comfort already when I got here. Uh, and Academy was really cool in terms of uh, supporting foreign students, in terms of the the process of signing up and you know the, the payments and class enrollments. My my wife, I say this all the time. My wife's the last. I I'm, I still feel kind of like the Swiss boy from the Alps coming to the States in big skyscrapers, Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz. It always seems kind of surreal, and it still feels kind of like that when I when I walk in the city. Yeah. So it wasn't. It was more like this is a cool place. <laughs> so to me, it was oh wow, I'm surrounded by people who love movies as well. They're super nerdy. Mm -hmm. There's a language support, and I'm taking classes where homework is watching movies. That's cool. You know, like it's, it just blew my mind. So yeah. to me, it wasn't, it was scary in terms of this is new. We never know. And it was of course sad leaving my parents and all my friends, but at the same time, this is really exciting. Oh, cool. So I think it was, I was very lucky in terms of timing and what, what happened around me. This is basically for the upcoming animators in order for them to actually mm -hmm. be inspired. But like when you actually kind of finish your degree mm -hmm. and then went into what am I doing now? Am I going mm -hmm. back home or am I going somewhere like Disney, ILM, etc.? What, what, what was that decision like? And did you kind of like apply to different places and see what happened? Or do you just, do you actually pause and thought about your decisions? I wanted to stay here. That was the hope. Okay. But you know, getting a job is really difficult. So I wasn't, I didn't want to go back just because I was kind of checked what's back in Switzerland. And to this day, it is not really a big animation industry. There's stuff happening, indie games and festivals and your shorts and stuff and, you know, commercial work. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like Hollywood type thing, isn't really there. So Switzerland was never the, the option of, I'm going to go back there and, and have a job there. My eye was towards the States, knowing that I might have to go somewhere else. 
uh, New Zealand, like where I was was there and everything. So, but my eye was fixed on on the state. I graduated in May two thousand three. And back then it was VHS tapes for demo reels. But I sent it out to like 50 or 60 companies. Yeah. And I had a, a postcard stamped, like self-addressed, like, thank you for looking at my reel. Please send this back to me. Like naively oh. thinking they would do that so I would know they receive it. And out of like 60 tapes, I got maybe three back. <laughs> no one care, right? When you graduate, you have kind of a demo reel fair that the school does. People that, oh. I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if it was Tippett Studio, but it was a, a studio involved with Sasha Troopers 2. They were interested, but then said no, because my work visa was not ready. Oh, I interviewed no. at ESC for The Matrix 2, and it was a great interview. They asked, hey, can you do overtime? You need people right now. We were crunching. I said, yes. And then they said, no, later on, because you have no visa. So then in three months, I get my work visa and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So for all of the summer, I just did tests at home and went back to the academy in fall, which I don't think they have anymore. I could do a, a personal enrichment class, I guess mm -hmm. that was the one. And then built a new reel based on that, sent out another 50, 60 tapes, and then it got some more traction. Actually, a rigger from Sony saw my reel mm -hmm. and then gave that to his Adam Soups, who then saw, looked at it and then flew me in for an interview, which again, as a Swiss boy, blew my mind. Someone is yeah. paying for flight ticket, that Christmas thing was um, was a change. My reel was better, and then interviews, a few interviews came in, and then timing was just fortunate. ILM was finishing or starting up, sorry, uh, episode three, so they needed people, and uh, they also heard about my my tape. I have to give thank you officially to Sean Kelly, because uh, no. he was teaching at the academy. People were saying, "Hey, Sean Kelly and Delia Termatosi, it was ILM people that were teaching yeah. there." go up there and show your stuff. So I went upstairs, showed him my tape. Uh, he was so patient again. Thank you, Sean. Uh, he looked <laughs> at everything and he, he told me, you know, do this, cut this, change that. Like you don't ask for jobs. Like, okay, thank you. And then I just walked away. And then and it was like in a, in a cliche movie, right before the door, he said, wait, when you reel is better and you update everything, mm -hmm. send it to me again and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and then I did that. And then the interviews happens. And then I got, I got a, an interview at Sony on Friday. Mm -hmm. came home answering machine ilm interview on monday um and then it was just kind of back and forth of you know the interview and telling people where else have you, do you have offers or not mm -hmm. and ilm said yeah we'll give you a work visa you just have to start as an intern 15 bucks an hour back then and they just bumped it to 18. they paid for the work visa it was crazy and it was like express so it, I, ha I had it in, in right away that's amazing and i started there yeah it was it was so nice and again i feel like it was just timing wise very lucky. Yeah, now you mentioned Sean Kelly, and I feel like he's one of the nicest person in the industry. He's just he is. so patient and has yes, time for yes. everybody. We talk sometimes and like just like messages. Such a cool, cool guy. Yes, yeah. thank you, Sean, again. He's, he's so, super patient. Um, just the help that he got. And also just, you know, you're a foreigner and you started the company. Yeah. You might say things that are in your culture more appropriate, but not so appropriate within a corporate culture, or at least ILM in the States. So he helped me out a lot with, like, hey, maybe don't say this or don't do that. And yeah. But everybody was very supportive. Uh, Rob Coleman was the Adam Soup as well on Star Wars. Very patient. Sweet. I would give I would give notes to people. Like, not notes, but like in terms of, hey, you have this shot. This is so cool. What if you would do this? Uh -huh. And he ended up being, telling them what to do. I was so annoying. And then he <laughs> gave me a call. said, listen, we love your enthusiasm, but stop doing this. I'm the soup. Yeah, let's do it this way, but yeah. in the nicest way. He could have been so mean and just yeah. like a smackdown. Was like, no, no, look, we love it. It's great, but you know, this is how we work. I know you're new. This yeah. is the, these are the steps. I was, uh, I was so patient. Just channel your enthusiasm a little bit more to the left. In yes, the this way. Yes. <laughs> Stop being so annoying. That was the message. <laughs> If you count them, how many movies have you worked so far? What was your favorite movie? And what was your favorite director to work for? 30? 30 movies. Jesse 40? Corn. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking and and browse my IMDB. I don't wanna overinflate my contributions <laughs> to, to nothing. Uh, it turns out it was five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> When I say 30 or 40 movies, I don't know how many. There's some movies you barely work on and then some movies yeah. you yeah, you work a bit longer. In terms of favorite movies, like to me, episode three is always going to be really high up. I wouldn't okay. say it's the best movie, no. uh, but it's my first movie. There's just a lot of memory attached to it. Again, the people, it's your first time being exposed to this. Yeah. And it was such a large show that gave me the opportunity to do keyframe, mm -hmm. mocap, creatures, uh, camera work, Star Trek. It was also good. I was I'm a big Star Trek fan. 
Oh, which Star Trek that you worked on? The JJ. The JJ uh, ones? Oh, yeah, man, one I love those. That's that cool. one is a big one too. Yeah. But then again, I didn't work too much on Rango. I came in towards the end. But then Rango was an animated feature totally and, different than what we've done before. That was yeah. a big one. To be honest, Force Awakens as well, just because oh, after all this time, yeah. suddenly a new Star Wars yeah. uh, under Disney, just a, a new corporate ownership, new environment, new culture, and then starting that new franchise again. That was a big one too. There's something poetic to be said about you worked on the last Star Wars of the old saga. Well, not old, old, but you know, the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you worked on the new Star Wars of the, of this generation. Also, the cool. ends. If I get laid off now, it's fine. It will be. It will be fine. Right? Right. It will be working <laughs> on the end of that trilogy. Now, the end of that trilogy. That's it. That's it. My favorite director. Again, it's tricky. Sometimes you have directors that are, they can be like very picky. Mm -hmm. Picky but nice, and then some are picky but a bit more complicated. Uh, but it's at the same time also really cool. Like I worked on um, Tomorrowland, and that was Brad Bird. Yeah. And not much, like a couple shots. And I never had like any clients, you know, like contact or relationship or anything. But there I say he was very picky in terms of posing and the frames, but mm -hmm. in such a good way where it's like you learn from it. Like, oh, this is why you want to do this. He would explain things and he was uh -huh. very humble. He always thank you for all the notes. And That's like cool. that, that was cool in terms of like that exposure. Mm -hmm. But then it's also cool like going back to George Lucas. He was just, he was very, as long as it feels like Star Wars, do whatever you want. That was kind of the direction. That's cool. And then you would do something, like, no, 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 do it like, like he would give you direction, obviously, but it yeah. felt very free in terms of what you want to do. Versus sometimes the other directors where you, you're stuck to the previous, like, you know, mm -hmm. no, 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 do this, basically copy the previous, but just make it a bit more polished and that's it. JJ is really nice. Again, not like a huge client relationship, like I talked to him. But mm -hmm. in terms of like how what you hear for the reviews and the notes, it's very creative as well. Yeah. You know, like you know what I mean? Like I don't I'm not in their shoes. Like I know what their day is. So yeah. I can't really it's easy for me to judge, but at the same time, would I do a better job? Probably not. I yeah, exactly. Cool. I mean, if you actually get a bad shot, no one is gonna know who you are. But if they get a bad <laughs> movie, then obviously they actually get everyone saying, Oh no, it was Brad Bird, or no, it was JJ Abrams. Yeah, they have they have so much responsibility and they have the overview of the whole right. movie in mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have the overview of a shot, maybe exactly. a sequence. Like, how was your path from going from junior to being a soup at, at ILM? Like, did it took a long time? Do you actually found it kind of uh, straightforward? Let's put it this way. I would not recommend to anybody starting somewhere as an intern and staying at the company for that long. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a great company and you're comfortable and it, it obviously works with your life and everything. And I say this in terms of if you start somewhere and you would switch different companies, I think you have a lot more experience. Mm -hmm. Your paycheck might go up because you might negotiate, you know, different rates, um, different exposure to people and clients and styles of work. At the same time, um, I was also very comfortable just staying at that company. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's it's a longer path. But I mean, I started as an intern and became a junior, I think after like six months. And then after that, you just... You're an animator, and then you might become a senior animator, and it's not like da da. There's a there's a, like it's a celebration. Like it just suddenly it changes in your in your file or something. Yeah. Uh, so like someone tells you, and then I think my first lead job was on Transformers Two. You also have to tell management what you want. They can't guess your path or what your interests are. Sure. Like you feel like, hey, why am I not getting this? But you got to tell people what you want. Yeah. I wrote all the soups. Hey, I'm thinking about becoming a lead well what your advice be what should i do and how do you see it and they say yeah you know, in a couple of years you're ready blah 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 um and then it happened a bit faster mainly probably because i voiced my interest mm -hmm. so then people are like oh maybe we should give that to him and scott benza was the soup on uh, transformers thank you scott he made me a lead and that was the big first transition learning about that stuff and then it's kind of and then it's, it, it is a bit fluid where you're a lead on a show and then you're an animator on the show like it always kind of goes back and forth you know oh, okay. you're not always in that position. It depends yeah. on the type of work. If you do previous, you won't be a lead. Mm -hmm. um, the size of the crew. Yeah. And then and then it was a big, big stretch where I liked that role. And then at one point I thought, maybe I should try more. Maybe I want to do something a bit more. And then it was more like um, the unofficial supervisor role. So on Star Trek, uh, Paul Cavanaugh, he's a soup on, on Star Trek. And he went, he left for on vacation. And he said, okay, well, I'm gone. 
you take over and you basically act as a soup. So there was kind of that. And sometimes we had Star Wars commercials that would come in, but it was never the official capacity or given the title of your supervisor. Okay. That happened on The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi was officially titled uh, Associate Animation Supervisor. Solo was, mm -hmm. was the next one. Now I'm doing uh, The Last, um, The Rise of the Skywalker. Okay. So there's no supervisor role uh, in that regard. It's also a smaller team. You were breaking down to me on Twitter when we were chatting about how you split out your day and how right. you make it happen because you have work and then you have what well, you have family first, <laughs> work <laughs> and then you have, let's and then, change our order. Right, let's change the order. <laughs> and then you have an animation mentor and you also have YouTube. How do you go about on 24 hour day to break down things so you can make it happen week in and week out? It depends. It depends on the schedule. Because the thing is, I don't always have a mentor class. It depends on um, how many people sign up, mm -hmm. right? So it's not always, especially creature classes are kind of on and off. You never quite know. Like mm -hmm. the more beginner classes are a bit more more stable. I also teach at the academy in the city, which wow. is the same thing. Sometimes you have no sign up. Sometimes you have enough. Depends on the class and the class mm -hmm. interest. I usually want to do all of them mm -hmm. just in case none of it happens. So every now and then I have a semester where I don't teach nothing except okay. my workshops. And then it's, it's much more relaxed. Last semester was not so good because everybody said yes. So I had an on-site academy class. I had an online academy class. And then I wow. had animation mentor and then my workshops. And then the YouTube thing that became more and more work. Yeah. It was way too much. I got it. It was you know, like, as my workshop people can, can say, yeah. sometimes my feedback comes after three days instead of one day. So I try to do everything in the morning or like most uh -huh. of it in the morning. I get up at quarter to five in the morning. Now mm -hmm. this sounds horrible, but I also go to bed at 10 or 10 30 or maybe 11. Yeah. I try to have six to seven hours of sleep. Like I want to sleep um, if my dog lets me. So I get up at quarter to five and then I usually do all the teachings, the critiques. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the schedule. I want to do everything at that point. And then if I have time, I do something else because I don't want to work on the weekends. Like that's kind of usually the thing that I do. Saturday, Sunday, I don't touch anything. It's just family time. Because to me, it's, I'm rarely home, so it's more um, quality over quantity. We kind of try to do that. Yeah. I mean, I try to be home in the evenings during the week for you know dinner and bedtime and reading to my kid. But it's mostly weekends, you know, penciled out. I don't work. I'm trying to do that as well. I'm not so good. I'm, I'm just like learning. I'm just getting started and I do one video at a time. And uh -huh. it takes so much mental capacity to just go like <laughs> what am i trying to say really yeah like you just i don't know if you feel the same but whenever i speak the camera for some reason i just feel like i am talking nonsense and then <laughs> half, of the, half of the time when i press like stop recording i'm like what am i saying <laughs> well let's put it this way you can tell i mean your your stuff is great it's it feels like you know what you're talking about uh, thanks because that's so not how just, it feels here it's just in your head <laughs> Uh, last question before you leave. Mm -hmm. What is the, your favorite thing uh, outside of chilling with your family, obviously, that you like to do in your spare time? My favorite thing that I like to do? Okay, not naming family. Not naming family. It does take up a big thing. I was loving with my little kid. It's going to be super cliche, but I do love watching movies. Like, I love researching. Like, I obsess too much about researching things about like, mm -hmm. anything. Movies or if I will buy something new. Researching, oh, what is this? What's this product? Did someone do a review? I love water. I love yeah. swimming. Like, I play tennis. Like, I love sports. Yeah. But there's something about watching movies. I don't know if that makes me sound simple or something, but like, oh. I watch Chernobyl, right? And you see this on the big screen and every now and then I have this, this feeling of, this is so cool. I yeah. love the, the composition. Like exploring a movie, you start a movie, you don't know who the characters are, you don't know where things go, especially with the TV show. Yeah. And 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 finding that the characters, the, the story, I just love watching movies. There I say, it's it's screen time and it's not me being like, I love hiking, I love being in the nature. <laughs> and I was, I'm watching Barry right now. On, on HBO, which is so good. And there's a scene where uh, Barry's girlfriend, she just, she has a massive rant. Mm -hmm. And it's this one long shot and she's so good in it. It just keeps so much, so much where you think, wow, you could trip over that line so easily. Mm -hmm. It's amazing she could do this in one take. Now I'm watching this and I go to my wife, this is one take. She's gotten very patient just ignoring me. It's like, yeah, she's just watching this. But yes, like there's cool. there's a lot more where like, wow, this is so cool. I can't believe they did that. But uh, but thanks very much for joining me. Uh, I hope you keep enjoying the rest of your day with your family and mm -hmm. uh, keep up the great work that you're doing with YouTube and your course. Thank you. And 
I think uh, we all should help each other. And as I always like to say, knowledge, it's, it's, it's borrowed. So it should be given to other mm -hmm. people. You always learn mm -hmm. from other people. And I think you're a very inspiring character because that's exactly Thank what you, you kind of help everyone. I can see you on Twitter. You just share the love with everyone. And that's really, really cool to see and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, for taking the time. I appreciate that, uh, that you did. Most welcome. Most welcome. All right. So I'll continue seeing you on your YouTube channel and speaking with you on Twitter as usual. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And as you can hear in this interview, JD has so much experience working in so many different movies. And I think when you meet someone like that, that knows so much about so many things and has been through so many motions, and the VFX industry is very fast moving, I think it's only right for you to to stop, pay attention and listen to what they have to say because you are definitely bound to find or learn something new. And JD does that every week on his channel. So if you haven't subscribed to him yet, go ahead and click on the link below in order to subscribe to him as well because he dishes out knowledge every week and every week he has some gold to give for sure. I know I have subscribed and uh, I had a lot of fun talking with JD. I think we are both in the same wavelength we are both in this path of trying to actually teach others. I really believe personally that all knowledge is borrowed and you should give it back because you have learned all the things that you've learned through practice and experience. So if you can actually share that knowledge after you acquired it with someone else in order to hopefully make their journey a little easier, it only makes sense. And whoever actually learns from you, you will always be thankful for whatever you actually kind of, or whatever part you actually had on their journey to become an animator, to become an artist. And that's all I had for you guys today. So as always, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, and this is the first time that you've seen one of my videos, there's a lot of different interesting subjects that I have talked about, and there's always something to be learned. So if you like the content, please subscribe. I shall see you guys in a week's time. Have a great rest of the week. And until then, stay well, stay safe. Peace.